topic tonight, creating vibrant health through dowsing and radionics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ned Wolf. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Welcome, sir. I'd, I'd hoped you'd edit that some. Uh, did I miss? No, <laughs> quite the contrary. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to echo what Bob had to say. I certainly appreciate you all being here this weekend. It's a lovely thing that you, you could be doing unlimited other things, and here you are. So what a treat. Thank you. Uh, Normally, I do some introduction. That just got handled. So we're going to move on. Dowsing. I'm going to talk a little about dowsing. Uh, are there people here who have never done dowsing before? You don't think so? Well, that's probably pretty good. Okay, so a few. So most of the people here have done some dowsing. So we're going to be talking about how to use it specifically for our health and how it's used in a number of applications. Uh, and I encourage you, and this is the place where I think questions are important, if we're moving through something and you're not clear about it, especially those of you who are just starting out with dowsing, feel free to ask questions and we'll address whatever needs to be illuminated. Uh, basically, dowsing is a skill, a discipline, very ancient, that allows us to access inner wisdom from the deeper parts of the self. Uh, one example that I like to share is, uh, some of you may be familiar with the works of Raymond Moody, who, who wrote, a, a medical doctor who wrote stories about near-death experiences. And he cataloged a lot of similarities in these experiences, and one of the things he discovered was that people, when they pass into the next dimension in the afterlife, many, many of them report being in a place, and they do the tunnel and the noise and the white light and all that, you know, and the, the lineup of friends you're all hoping to see when that moment comes. Uh, but he says that many, many people in many cultures have the very similar experience of arriving at a place where they have access to all knowledge. And he didn't say, oh, I got to a place where I knew everything. It wasn't that experience. It was, ah, I'm at a place where I can reach out and I can gather all knowledge that I would ever want to look at. What an amazing notion. This was before the days of Google, of course. <laughs> Now, the thing that dowsing demonstrates for us is that actually we have a tool at our disposal that will allow us to do that, and you don't have to die first. What do you think? <laughs> I think that works. So it's an ancient discipline. It acknowledges that there are many levels of the self, and that that level of the self that has access to all knowledge is accessible. We'll talk today a little about how we can block that access, how we can open up that access, and how we can use it for our own health, supporting others in claiming greater measure of their own health. And we'll talk a little about the, one of the practices that I use is called radionics. Just a little bit of introduction there. Radionics is a science that was developed about 120 years ago in the West Coast, on the West Coast. Uh, based on the notion that every part of the body has its own unique vibration. And that vibration will change if the body is, that particular part of the body is not experiencing a state of health. That's useful information because then we can, with dowsing, identify a frequency or a vibration that would support that particular part of the body in recovering its health. Basically, that's what radionics is. It may sound very similar to homeopathy, which it is, although the distinction is, is that frequencies are identified radionically using dowsing, where traditionally homeopathy uses a very, mic a very microscopic measure of a substance 
that gets diluted, 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 so that what you're dealing with is only the electromagnetic signature of a substance, and that electromagnetic signature is then used to support the body's healing. So uh, we're replacing that frequency based on a substance with a frequency based on dowsing, and that gives us access to all sorts of things that we couldn't access homeopathically. Uh, so I'll talk a little about that. Now just a little about my practice. When I started this work about 35, I don't know, a while back, uh, I had three criteria for what I was looking for. I was looking for modalities that would, one, be absolutely safe. No chance of any side effects that were damaging. Two, would be absolutely low cost. That it was accessible to anyone. And three, it had to be effective. Those were my three criteria. So obviously the, the, the modalities that I use, I have had practiced on me, I've studied, I've learned, I teach them, because they fit all three of those criteria. I studied for many years with a woman named Hannah Kroger, a wonderful teacher in Colorado. Raise your hand if you've heard of Hannah. Oh, good. So there are people here that have. Uh, she's talking to us from the other dimensions as we speak. But then, so many do. Um, <laughs> An another brief story here, it's kind of funny. I, lived, I was living in Seattle at the time and working in the corporate world and I had developed a rash across my forehead. And this rash across my forehead looked so bright and red I felt like I was a walking traffic signal. Now I don't know how other people would feel about this but it really piqued my vanity, I'll tell you. It was just making me sideways that this thing was going on. And it went on for years, for a couple of years. Finally, I had heard of Hana, and I sent, Hana said, well, send me a, a witness. Uh, we'll talk about that. Send me something that carries your energy field. I sent that, and she did some dowsing testing, and she sent back a few radionic remedies. And in six weeks, it cleared up. My outer mind vanity was thanking her for no one else was. I mean, this was amazing. So I studied with Hannah for many years and, and took her to Seattle and introduced her to the community there. We did a number of workshops there because I found her so effective in what she did. A uh, hundred and fifty years ago, a man named Max Freeman Long, anybody heard of Max Freeman Long? You, you can come up here and do this part. <laughs> no, no. Even the one that was written after he died by, oh, yeah, by Dolly Winter. Max Freeman Long heard about the kahuna in Hawaii, and he was amazed that these folks who studied the huna philosophy, huna religion, not so much a religion as we understand religion, but a huna perspective, he was amazed that these people could, were, were renowned for their clairvoyance renowned for their consciousness, renowned for their ability to heal. They were people who could stop an engine from running at a distance. By God, we could use that. Uh, amazing abilities of consciousness that he was completely inspired by the, these stories. He went to Hawaii with the notion, I'm going to write a dictionary of the Huna language, and in that discover perhaps some of the secrets of their wisdom. And I don't know if the dictionary ever got completed, but he came back with some great wisdom, one of which was the Huna model for what the self is. And it was not a requirement that you have to live in Texas in order to have a self, although you know, I was just yesterday made an honorary Texan and so I'm, I'm kind of still settling into what that's like. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's bigger. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he said there, the, the Huna people believed there were three facets to the self. One, the conscious mind. Two, the subconscious mind. And the third was you could consider it the superconscious. I call it the inner self uh, but the point is, 
There are three dimensions of the self in the Huna perspective, one of which is very much focused in time and space, one of which seems to be a dimension between time and space, and the second dimension which we occupy, you could call that the astral realms, you could call it the energy realms, you could call it heaven, you could call it the spiritual realm, call it something not limited by time and space. And there may be, in fact I'm sure there are, countless different dimensions that this embraces. Now this isn't all that, I mean it could have been that Freud went and taught the Huna, how to, no, no, it's, it's a, but it's pretty much the same thing, except that he said they, they had an interesting notion here. He said, information easily flowed between the conscious and the subconscious. A doorway between the conscious and the subconscious where information flows quite easily. And yes, we have the ability with a conscious mind, we can shut that down. Anybody have any notions about how you might want to shut down <laughs> communication between the conscious and the subconscious? Your will. With your will? Yes, turn the TV on. Turn Alcohol. the TV on. Alcohol or drugs. <laughs> Alcohol or drugs, right. Self-condemnation, self-punishment, anger. Actually, I don't think any emotion will shut that down unless we resist the emotion. If we say, I shouldn't be feeling anger, I'm bad because I feel anger, uh, anger shouldn't be happening at this moment, if we relate to it that way, we shut it down, yes. If we resist an emotion. Anything we're doing as a distraction would be. Any distraction could be a, could be anything that's yes. used as a distraction. Yes. Anything that distracts us from the experience of our own feeling in the moment, yes, could be what you'd consider shutting that down. But here's another one. It's your fault I'm feeling angry. Blame shuts that down. That's an interesting notion. If I refuse to accept that I actually put this experience in my life, if I refuse to accept responsibility for what I'm experiencing, that will shut that down. Blame, of course, blocks that door. Blame blocks healing. The other one that's our, many, many of us have a great favorite is called self-pity. That also shuts that down. Because, of course, self-pity is that, <laughs> can't believe it, it's too bad. <laughs> oh, that's good, come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Shuts the door. Interesting, it's said that the subconscious carries information to all lifetimes. So the subconscious then is outside of time and space because we're talking all lifetimes. You might as well consider the future ones as well. So now we're outside of the normal conscious perspective of what time and space is about, which is you know, remember Stephen Hawking said that wonderful thing? He said, I don't know why we don't remember the future as effectively as we remember the past. <laughs> There's nice physics in that one. That's very good. Anyway, open doorway between the conscious and the subconscious. Open doorway between the inner self and the subconscious. So, information flows this way. But there's no doorway between the inner self and the conscious. That, I think, is one of the most powerful things Max Freeman Long came up with. If you want to connect with the dimension of yourself that exists beyond time and space, you must go through the subconscious. You cannot deny the fact that you have a body in order to get to the spiritual self. Max Freeman Long said that. Came up with it from the kahuna. An amazing piece of wisdom that we seem to overlook in our very... Well, I'm not going to go into that, but we seem to overlook the fact that we're here because we get the chance to have a body. That's an important part of the act of creation, of the act of connecting with the realms beyond time and space. And by the way, you know the one requirement that you all must have if you're going to douse. You know what that is? I mean, we've got the pendulum handled, so we know that's it, not it. What must you have in order to douse? Well being. A body. Uh, yeah a body. You must have a body. I know you and I find at home being in other dimensions. That we're just stopping off here in what the aboriginals in Australia called the extraordinary realm. They say the realm of time and space is the extraordinary realm. Wow. 
the realms where we are at home, you don't need so much of a body. You know, it's a lot different. It's easier. Interesting. No communication here. Doorway there, doorway there. We have the power to block those doorways. There's also another little feature here which is very handy for those of us who may be in the, uh, uh, what's the, uh, cardinal or fixed astrological signs. You may, you may especially like this part, that here in the conscious self there is an ego, a time and space ego useful, can, can become fixed, can become, you know, very self-important. Here in the inner self, we also have a spiritual ego. Notice no ego here. No real choice-making function here in the subconscious. It responds to the choices coming from here and here. Isn't that, in, that's very useful, by the way. We'll talk about, well, we'll demonstrate some of that Dowsing is one of the most useful tools I can think of to be able to train the conscious time and space ego, the outer ego, to reflect what's going on in the inner ego. I don't know. That sounds pretty amazing to me. I don't know of many disciplines that say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to work with your intellect in a way that it melds itself with your intuition. Ah, we're going to work with your time and space awareness in a way that embraces and marries your, your access to all knowledge awareness, your intuitions. It's not that one is better than the other. It's not that one should dominate the other. They are meant to work together. And when they do, both are expanded. You want to expand your intellect? Embrace more of your intuition. You want to expand your intuition? Be more rigorously honest with your intellect. And it's an amazing partnership that we were designed to embrace, and dowsing is a fantastic tool in which to accomplish that. And, for those of you, how many, how many people have been dowsing for a year or more? Only a few, okay. So, those of you who've been dowsing a while, one of the things I want you to know is that, well, you're gonna outgrow it. At some point, you will not use it because the connection you have between your intellect and your intuition works so fast that the pendulum only slows you down. Now that's a very interesting notion too. So ultimately, we want you to get so good at this that you don't use it anymore. You don't use dowsing anymore. I lived for a number of years in Western Australia, hence the the book of Western Australian flowers. Uh, and I heard about how the Aboriginal people there dows. I said, here's how they, they, they told me, here's how Aboriginals go out and they find a healing herb. So, and they teach this from the time the children are very young. By the way, this is a civilization that it's been around for at least 60,000 years. We have no other example of anything that's even close. Imagine a civilization that has sustained itself and grown and nurtured for 60,000 years. I mean, what are we up to? Maybe 2,000, maybe four, maybe if you want to be real generous, 4,000 years. And whether we're sustainable or not is another question. Right, but it is an interesting thing. A 60,000 year long civilization very much tuned into their intuitions, very much tuned into how do we use dream time. They taught their children how to douse for healing herbs. And they said, okay, so you go out into the bush. I'll just wait for this to finish, there you go. You go out into the bush and you keep on your mind focused the illness or the condition you want to heal. Just wander out into the bush and just wander wherever you're guided to move and listen to the plants sing they teach children listen to the plants sing and the plant that sings the loudest that's the one you bring home and you treat the illness with
They didn't have to go through this whole thing about, okay, well, you know, we'll pull out the string and the dental floss and we'll tie it to something, you know, we forget it. They taught them how to access their intuition. A lovely notion. Dowsing is a very lovely way to do that to the point where, of course, most of us have heard about water dowsing. That's how I learned about dowsing. And I walked around, this dowser gave me the two rods and said, walk around. And I walked around, you know, just. And then at one point they crossed. And I, I swear I had nothing to do with it. It just crossed. And I said, how's that? He said, I don't know. Dig there. The water was there. Okay. Who cares? I mean, we could talk about, okay, well, we opened up the door between the subconscious. And the, the bottom line is, What's the result? Does the work you do with your own dowsing for your own health, does it support your healing? You will know the answer to that. You will know by the results. That's the question you've got to be willing to face. You see, dowsing doesn't matter whether you're right. We often go into explorations, we go into our health issues, saying, well, what's the reason for this? I've got a pain in my zorch. What's the reason for this? And we spend all of our time in our intellect trying to understand the condition. And we say, once we understand the condition, then we can treat the condition. Well, maybe. Although, you know, we don't seem to have a medical system that, that is resoundingly demonstrating effective results. So, okay, do what works is my motto, and the, the con, um, reverse of that is also very helpful, which is stop doing what doesn't work. Very helpful, and especially in the realm of healthcare. Do what works, and you can tell by the result. Stop doing what doesn't work. I have clients come in and talk about how the medical profession has got a great explanation for why they're not healing. But you see, we're talking really about the, the one small difficulty, which is that we have to accept here who is creating the experience. That question's not open for debate. If you want to accept the role of victim and that somehow some force outside of me caused my lack of well-being, then you get stuck with your lack of well-being. Or you can decide you want to expand your consciousness and say, okay, I will accept that I am solely responsible for my well-being. And frankly, that's the only way I'm willing to work with clients is if they understand that's what I will expect of them. Their consciousness produces their well-being or lack of it. So you must accept, if you're going to step into this whole realm of dowsing, that you are a being of unlimited power. And I know you can, you can have people line up around the block and want to argue that point with you and tell you why it's not true and give you all sorts of very well-reasoned and rational ideas why that's not true, but ultimately it doesn't matter. The point is, what produces the result? And if you're in the areas of your own health, if you're not getting results, if you're experiencing something chronic, then I would suggest there is something about the way you are misusing your own consciousness that is producing the imbalance. You see, because how we use our consciousness, it's, the universe doesn't care whether I'm focused on a useful notion or a destructive notion. The universe just says, I'll manifest whatever you focus on. Wherever you concentrate, that's what you get. Just a, yes, I'm, I'm at that stage. I have to reveal something more about myself. Uh, I grew up in a large Catholic family. I was the second of eight children. I uh, was the second of eight children, and I was only one of two males in that 
group, so I have six sisters. There were certain cha there were certain challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, one of which was that in, in this family, we of course being Catholic and of course having issues around addiction in the family as well, we were we were people who were into self punishment. You know, guilt was a good motivator, you know. And um, and I went through a, a very notable progression of addictions before I finally said, okay, I'm ready to face this. What's really going on here? Why would I get into self-destructive mode? Why would I use my consciousness self-destructively when that is so counterproductive? You know, it's not the brightest way to use this incredible creative power that emanates from consciousness. Why would I do that? And um, a few years ago, well, not that long ago, I was, I was congratulating myself on the fact that, that I really had, had accomplished this business of, of facing addiction, and I'd moved past it, and, I'd, and I was saying, I, th I think I'm done with self-punishment. I, th I, I think I'm doing a good job. And about a week later, I was making myself dinner, ate, ate the dinner I made, and uh, and then I went off to a, a rehearsal, and about halfway through the rehearsal, I said, I'm not feeling that great. I'm going home. And I got home, and I went into the cycle of food poisoning. Anybody familiar with that one? Right. Yeah. And, uh, and then during the night, as I'm getting up and going back to the bathroom, and I collapse next to the bed, and I ram my head into the headboard of the bed. I don't think I've ever been hit that hard in my life as I hit myself. And as I was recovering, you know, standing up, I thought, my first thought was, hmm, I don't know that I'm quite as far past self-punishment as I thought. I could be maybe even deluding myself. I could be in a little bit of denial here, trying to get it right. Well, aren't I grand? I'm past self-punishment. The evidence says not so much. It was a useful lesson. It was very useful for me to realize how effectively I am at denying where I am if that doesn't suit my image of who I should be today. Ah, you could call it closing the door between the conscious and the subconscious. Sound familiar? Yes, we do this very well, by the way. But the interesting thing is that I run into a lot of people who seem to have a need for self-punishment. And the reason I bring it up is because there are two per persistent conditions that exist when we get stuck in this way of thinking. One is that in our normal encounter with day-to-day -day reality, we overemphasize negative information. Raise your hand if that sounds familiar. Somebody you know, somebody you know, maybe in the family, <laughs> maybe, overemphasizes negative information right and <laughs> two hands is good too yes it's good and the and the other thing is that those of us who need self-punishment we also distort our perspectives we distort our capacity to see reality one of the big ones is I'm bad Oh, I just made a mistake. I turned off the highway at the wrong exit and made it. You know what we do with that. I'm I shouldn't have done that. I just want to point out that's a distorted perspective. Number one, we're saying I'm unwilling to live life on life's terms because the reality is I got off on the wrong exit. But that doesn't undermine my validity. In fact, if I let myself look at it, I can discover how getting off on the wrong exit educated me somehow. Nelson Mandela said a wonderful thing. He said, I don't lose. He said, I either win or I learn. Oh, so we take this whole negative self-punishment bit out of the equation and we accept that what is, is. 
which is one of the conditions for living in life's terms. I mean, we can wander around, and we often do wander around and say, but what is shouldn't be. But the problem is we shut down the flow of information that's coming to us. And after generations and generations of this, it's a real conversation to be able to stand up in front of people and say, well, we have a tool here that will access part of you that you were always meant to access anyway. And you're going to outgrow it. And so my job is to make sure you get good enough at this so you stop using it. Does that sound crazy? Yes, that sounds a little crazy. Yeah. But interesting. So I just want to point out that if you're working in those particular lessons, please do not make this a place of self-condemnation or, God forbid, more self-punishment, but accept that it's a valuable lesson. And then here's the magic. You understand when you're in the middle of a lesson, especially one in which you have been for a while and you find yourself stuck, you find yourself maybe uh, congest chronic. That's it. That's the word we use. Chronic lesson. Here, this pain in my zorch has been going on for six weeks. You understand what is necessary in order to activate that process of growth and healing again? You understand what that dynamic is? Does anybody? Clues? Help? Okay, it's this simple. If you will accept where you are in this moment, that automatically accesses the process of growth and healing. If you will give up resisting where you are and saying, I should not be here. My well-being is compromised because I'm here. People won't love me because I'm here. I am somehow less than because I'm Throw all that out. Those are the distortions that our need for self-punishment embellish. I just wanted to make that point because it's a very useful one. Can I ask you a quick question? Please. So, okay, at this point, uh, have you learned a ways to remove, like, uh, you're telling us about the usage of a uh, you know, pendulum, and one of the usage of the pendulum, you know, any illnesses you have, any symptoms, like very first signs, you actually can use the pe pendulum and remove those symptom symptoms. And in your case, this was uh, food po poisoning. Yes. So, and I, I understand your question now. Okay. Th thank you. So the, qu the question is, can I use a pendulum to clear up a symptom immediately? I can even do it better than that. And in fact, we all do it better than that because we all heal in an instant. That's the only time healing happens is in an instant. However, the thing you need to remember the thing that's important is that the physical symptom isn't the issue. The physical symptom is the physical materialization of the issue. It's a symbol of the issue. The real question you're asking, and this is a great question, is can I shift my consciousness can it, from the misuse that I am engaged in that's producing the physical symptom, can I shift my consciousness in this moment so that the healing is completed? Yes. And as a matter of fact, that's the design we are all meant to follow. We're capable of that. We're meant to do it that way. Yes. And so perhaps today will be a, a way to move that process along that path. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we are beings of unlimited power. I want to repeat that because that's often something the outer ego has trouble accepting. The inner ego has no trouble accepting it. The outer ego wants to fight that message. We're beings of unlimited power and strength. We are beings who have a heritage of universal love, and it isn't because you turned out better than you thought. And if we can accept those two facts, then it's very interesting to start opening up to the idea that the inner self has access to universal knowledge, universal love, instantly and constantly two useful words, instantly and constantly at every moment through our lives. And if we can accept that, you are going to find dowsing is a much simpler process than you ever imagined. Because that's the place from which, if you will let yourself accept that truth about you, those distortions that are generated out of our self-punishing attitudes clear up very quickly. 
So I'm hoping with this to make the job much easier for you than it might otherwise be. Um, a few things about our healing that I just want to point out. Your healing's always happening. If you and I weren't healing at this very moment right now, we wouldn't be surviving. So you might as well accept that it's a natural, ongoing process, and the only way it gets interrupted is when we use our very powerful conscious mind in a way that disrupt, disrupts the process of restoring balance in the body. I don't deserve it. Yes, please. One thing I'm, remind, I'm reminded of that is people say, my headache is killing me, or my feet are Ooh, killing me, yeah. my back is killing me. I say, oh, don't, you're telling your subconscious. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Exactly right. Our thoughts are powerful, creative actions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have this uh, amazing notion that, uh, any, by the way, is anybody here dealing with an incurable illness? Isn't that lovely? Well, is anyone here dealing with a doctor who says you have an incurable illness? Okay. I just want to point out it's your choice how you want to use your consciousness, but that one's very interesting. Okay. If you put it there, how could it be incurable? If you actually are the causative force behind an imbalance in your body as a function of misuse of your consciousness, how could it be incurable? And in fact, I would suggest it takes less energy to heal the imbalance than it does to create it in the first place. Uh, I have clients who walk in my office and they say, well, you know, I, I say, well, you can do some dowsing testing and we can figure out which frequencies would be valuable and, and you can, you know, these remedies you can take three times a day and, and I don't know, 30% of them about this time say, man, man, I don't have time. I'm too busy. I can't take these remedies. One of my teachers said, great thing, he said, healing doesn't take time. Healing creates time. Please remember that one. It's very useful. All right. I beg your pardon? One of your teachers, or who said that? Leonard Orr, as a matter of fact, the founder of rebirthing. Okay. Uh, I've got to tell this story. And, and you, many of you may know the story, the story of Bethesda, the healing pool of Bethesda. Wonderful healing pool outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, people going in and out day in, day out, day of healing. For 10 years, laying next to the pool is a cripple, laying next to the pool. Now the story I heard when I was a little boy, well, you know, there's this upstart of a carpenter's son who wanders in and says, uh, he just looks at the cripple and says just one thing. He asks him the question, are you ready to heal? And the cripple, okay, yes. And, and Christ says, okay, then pick up your bed and go home. He doesn't say get in the water. He doesn't do He just says pick up your bed and go home. The cripple stands up, picks up his bed, and goes home, right? This is the story. And I'm thinking, for years I'm thinking, oh, isn't this a wonderful demonstration of Christ's power? He, all he has to do is ask, are you ready to heal? And the guy heals, wow. And then one day I'm thinking, hmm, what's it like being a cripple laying next to the Bethesda healing pool for 10 years? What's that like? Now one thing I know, when I put myself in that guy, one thing I know is that people are walking by all day long and say, hey, you need a little help? You mind if I just tip your bed in? <laughs> I mean, everybody's going by and saying, you want to? And what's he got to be doing for 10 years? He's saying, uh, no, nah. no thanks. For 10 years, he's got to be refusing all offers of support. What's going on? I mean, does that sound like this wonderful healing? Does that sound like anything anybody with a right mind would do? And he's doing it for 10 years. Then the light dawned. Ah, he wasn't ready to heal. No. You see, very interesting. 
Remember, I grew up with the six sisters. I was, I was kind of the outcast, you know, the older brother didn't want to play with dolls, didn't like their friends, go, don't bother me, that kind of a. One day I fell down in a, in a window well as I was working outside and I bruised the inside of my leg and I'm limping around like this in the house. And I hear one of my sisters say, in another room as she's seen me walk by, I hear one of my sisters say, what happened to Ned? And she says it in such a plaintive, caring voice. The first thing that goes through my mind is, I'm not going to stop limping. That's the first time I heard anyone express caring for me in a couple of weeks. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I have had times in my life where I was willing to substitute pity for love and was willing to even keep limping in order to see, come on, huh? what do you think? Who loves me? I don't, a lot of that in this world that we call love is actually pity and we say I'm going to stay stuck there because I'm not ready to heal, thank you very much. I'm not ready to change my consciousness. Oh, okay. I'd rather play victim, thank you. Okay, gotta be all right. I'd much rather go out into the world and say, everyone that wants to play victim, just get off it now. Everybody gets off it, we all move on. Okay, doesn't that, now we're talking. But that's not the world. That's not where we are. We came here to learn that, not have somebody bestow it on our head. All right, there are only two, ca there are, as I said, there are only two causes for what blocks healing. Two ways to block healing, blame, self-pity. There are only two causes for illness, a compromised self-respect, and a compromised self-expression. That's a very useful thing to remember.